Step into the realm of the extraordinary with Paranormal M, your guide to the mysteries of the universe. Subscribe now and enable notifications to join us on our quest for truth. Prepare to have your mind blown. The truth about shadow people. I often hear a lot of people throughout, not just all of Reddit, but the entire internet as well as that of reality, asking about shadow people. Sharing their experiences with them, among other things, involving their presence, what they do, what or who they are, and more. The word truth in the title is in quotes because... While I do not know if this is in fact the truth about the shadow people, it is the closest and most reasonable explanation I've come up with. I've done loads, and I mean loads, of research. If you are by chance wondering why I've spent so much time doing said research, it simply has all been driven by my pure fascination with these entities in general. And maybe deciphering the mystery of them has evolved into somewhat of an underlying passion of mine. Knowledge is power, after all. Some people say shadow people are interdimensional beings. Others say they're aliens, maybe they're ghosts, angels, or perhaps even demons. The list goes on. Now believe me when I say that I do not want to make this whole, well, make this rather a whole religious thing. I am not a superstitious person. I do, however, like to say that shadow people are jinns, spoken of the Islamic Quran, synonymously known jinns, that can actually take on any form they want. In other words, this is simply what I believe, for the most part at least, that many have claimed to be the truth. Until we get more information, however, we won't get much further in terms of deciphering the underlying and actual truth behind them. I'm just here to provide some of that information I've heard through the grapevine. Shadow people are jinns that were here before humans and are made of smokeless fire. Vitalicit, they are not actually shadows, but instead are made out of the same material as the heat on top of a flame. They live here on Earth among us, but cannot be seen simply and only when they choose not to be. They only show up if they feel as though it's necessary, or if they are called upon. And as for those who encounter shadow people involuntarily, this is because they are greatly attracted to people and or locations that radiate or associated with negative energy and or emotions. Emotions such as fear, anxiety, anger, inadequacy, etc. If your mind is under the influence in any shape or form or way that potentially unlocks great sensory or emotional channels that attract them as well, well, they can be seen. Most of them keep themselves unless they've been called upon or even provoked. Their lifespan is unknown, but could range anywhere from hundreds to thousands of years old. Though interestingly, they merely have the mental capacity of about a 10 or 15 year old. That is why a lot of the things they do are relatively inexplicable and can be incredibly difficult to interpret. The shadow people are actually more afraid of us than we are of them, but they are intrigued by us at the same time. Some can actually fall in love with humans, which could be a cause for contact. They also love it when we try to theorize about them, such as what I'm literally doing right now, because they actually never want people to know their truths. That is why I'm making this post, in hopes of uncovering what might be, but I could potentially literally be attracting them right now by making a post like this just to put that into perspective. Some people claim that humans have used shadow people since the days of Babylon for black magic, which is another topic in and of itself. Some shadow people can in fact be spirits or demons, as some may say. 
Alternatively, many people have documented benevolent encounters with them, to the point of absolutely insisting that they're harmless. I see people say this far too often, to be honest. They do, however, and factually speaking, have a dark agenda toward mankind. And while they may not always attack you physically, their war with you is one of the soul. So, how exactly should one go about getting rid of them? Well, first of all, only you find yourself encountering a shadow person or people frequently and they're not doing anything, such as by mostly standing there, menacingly staring you down, then you probably don't have much to worry about. Odds are, though, if that's happening to you, then you are radiating a relatively large amount of any of the negative emotions I mentioned earlier. The best thing to do is to simply ignore them. They usually just go away. If this doesn't work, a lot of people claim that mentally, or even verbally, telling them to leave, sometimes even swearing them out if necessary, especially in the form of shouting at them, works as well. Another method, which includes that of spitting at them, which is usually more effective, for shadow people are repelled by human body fluids such as saliva, blood, urine, tears, etc. They're also incredibly sensitive to sound, for it is my understanding that shadow people can hear the quietest of utterances of both your conscious and subconscious thoughts, even and including your memories. You can think of it like misophonia. This is why in terms of banishing them, some success stories I've heard involved shouting at them, or perhaps even singing one of your favorite songs as loud as you can just at the sight of them. Not only does this work because of how astronomically sensitive their perceptions are, but it also radiates positive energy that they clearly want nothing to do with. Thus, should you encounter any if you imagine something such as a loud, piercing scream, you just might cheese it out of there. If that doesn't work, you could try emitting a high-pitched frequency out of any speaker you have at your disposal. Unless, of course, you're dealing with a shadow person who means some serious business. They will always, well, almost always, not be able to handle it. It will send them packing. Some shadow people are stronger than others. So while some may be easy to get rid of, others may require more of an aggressive approach. With that, there is also the act of praying, which to my knowledge is one of, if not the most belligerent, method of banishment. It might work because using this method in any way certainly means you are on the right track in terms of expelling them, but from what I've heard, although I personally never tried this myself, the most aggressive and effective way of ridding you and or your home of shadow people is that of reciting certain religious verses in their native language. That caused them to quite literally burn, in parentheses, in hell. A lot of people also talk about encountering one very hostile shadow person in particular, usually seen wearing a trench coat, a top hat, sometimes, though rarely, a briefcase other times bearing red eyes, although any shadow person can have red eyes. They just aren't as common. They are, however, always malevolent. The entity in question and whom I'm referring to is known as the Hat Man. I sincerely promise you that he is not friendly, not even a little bit. If you see or have ever seen the Hat Man, then I feel very sorry for your misfortune. Well, he usually doesn't attack you physically, he normally comes around during very low, dark, sad, depressing points in our lives. He does this in order to do what many other shadow people do, feed off of our negative energy and emotions, which in turn makes him stronger. He also serves as a representation of an upcoming negative event, such as the death of a loved one or an accident of some kind. The short version is, he definitely is not good news. That about sums up everything factual that I know about shadow people. Forgive me for making this post very long, but I can only make a post so short while summing up the majority of what I've gathered about shadow people. Hopefully this answers, or maybe explains, some things that you've been wondering about. 
as well as any concerns you may have had. Again, just to clarify, I am by no means a superstitious person. I do not know if there is a god or gods, a heaven, a hell, an afterlife, or any of that. Shadow people may or may not at all be jinns, but aside from that claim, I firmly believe that nearly everything else I said rings true. So, if anybody would like to dispute this claim, or any that I've made, share your experience, or mention something that I neglected to, or just have any comments to make, I welcome your input. I'll also gladly answer any of the underlying questions that you may have, which I haven't touched upon here. Did I experience almost a decade-long haunting in order to send a message to their living relatives? This has quite a bit of backstory, so strap in. It started back in 2011. I was 12 and had moved into a new home with my family. From the get-go, that place made me feel some type of way. It wasn't bad, it wasn't good. Just like I was always being watched, which of course creeped me out. There were a handful of quote-unquote hotspots throughout the house. One being what we called the pink bathroom, which was, as you can guess, all pink. Pink tiling, pink sink, pink flooring, everything. It was also a bit small. I also felt like it was a bit hard to breathe in there and overall just hated the energy. Figured maybe I was just claustrophobic. Another was this part of the hall that led directly into my bedroom and branched off kind of directly into the living room as well. Kind of like a T in a road. Anyways, you almost always felt eyes on you coming from that corner, whether you were in the living room or my room. And it just felt like a creepy thing, well, regardless, morning or night. The final spot was, of course, the basement. The basement was half finished. The finished half was like a bar area, had the stools and everything still there, and the unfinished half was the laundry and storage room and workshop. Actually, when we first moved in there, my dad, sister, and I were looking through the workshop. There's a bunch of old yearbooks from the school that I went to. There's also some other memorabilia. We took a break, headed upstairs for lunch, and then came back to find that the door would no longer open. It seemed the door handle had fallen off while we were away. The door was stuck in place. Not super sure how that could have happened, especially considering it locked from the inside and none of us had locked it. On top of that, my mom made my sister and I wash her dog down in the basement. We had a laundry area in a big, sort of a tub sink thing. Well, we hated doing it. I always felt when I was down there that something was watching me. I even had an idea of what he looked like. I imagined a very tall man in a button-up and slack standing in the corner right by the entrance to the back of the bar area that resided mainly on the furnished side. My hair would stand on end. Always I would sprint up those stairs whenever I was done down there. The rest of the house felt off, but those were the big spots that just radiated energy. But, anywho, let's actually fast forward a few years. We moved out around 2014, and by that point I had a handful of bad dreams about that house. I had dreams of it when I lived there, which made sense, but even after leaving they persisted. They actually persisted up until about 2020, by that point I was 21. I had been having dreams of that place for nearly a decade, and by this point the dreams escalated to night terrors. I would wake up screaming in the middle of the night, the dreams always occurred every three to six months. But by April of 2020 I had three intense night terrors about that house within three months. The last dream being my sister telling me somebody had died in the pink bathroom. I started realizing that maybe something else was going on. I started researching the house and found the first owners, the ones who had built that house back in, I believe, the 1950s. 
This seemed like a good place to start, so I quickly discovered that it was family that lived there, and that the father had died in the house in the 1980s. Upon further investigation, I learned that he had died of a massive heart attack in the house. This house was located almost directly across the street from the hospital, like the driveway in the hospital lot entrance lined up. Definitely clued me in on this being a traumatic death, so I continued. I found his wife's obituary. She had stayed in the house after he had passed, and since she had passed more recently, the information regarding her children was more up to date. I immediately felt drawn to one particular child, their daughter. They only had one. I actually ended up finding her on Facebook and reaching out. Of course, I realized what I was about to do could potentially be harmful or hurtful, so I prepared my message accordingly. I even mentioned the hot spots that we covered earlier, and I didn't mention what sensations or events happened in those areas, though, since I wanted to see what she had to say. My heart stopped when I read. He died in the pink bathroom. The last dream where I dreamed my sister told me somebody died in the pink bathroom. Could it have been a weird coincidence? She continued to say that he loved his workshop, that he never let anybody in it, and on top of that, always spent time downstairs by the corner entrance to his bar since that's where he kept his favorite drinks. My bedroom belonged to his wife who no longer loved him the way that he loved her, which would make sense as to why I felt eyes from the doorway but never would get that presence entering my room. She also shared she was the child closest with her father and they shared the room my sister stayed in. I asked my sister about this later on. She stated she definitely felt uncomfortable in the house but never anything specific. I told the daughter the man I saw in my imagination the very tall, well-dressed man. She said her dad was six foot three and a businessman, always in a button-down and slacks. She also sent me a picture of him and it was the exact man I saw in my head. After this, I've never had another dream involving that house ever again. It's been almost three years free from those awful dreams. Could he have used me to tell his daughter he was so close that he was still around? that there was more to the other side. And the only way to get my attention was through my dreams. It almost seemed so self-absorbed to think that he would choose me to do such a thing. But I'm not sure of any of the other explanations. All my life I've had weird paranormal or borderline psychic occurrences. But this one is definitely the most interesting to date. Did I just step into an alternate universe? The Twilight Zone, maybe. It happened minutes ago. Fully awake, 3 a.m. where I am. I just finished a movie. I turned the TV off, just laid on the couch in the dark for a while. I don't know what came over me, but I got the urge to suddenly get up and move around in Rome, slowly. I then fixated on the street light just coming in from the window, making a bright stripe on the carpet. It was so bright, I swear, the brightest thing I've ever seen. I then got this feeling that this was the light. It's the light when talking about heaven, otherwise known as don't go into the light. The only reasoning I have for why I thought the light was heaven is because recently my dog had passed away. It's been extremely hard on me and constantly on my mind. My arms and shoulders then instantly felt weightless. Felt like I was floating around the room. Again, I'm not fully awake. Or rather, I am fully awake. All of my senses are maxed out. Feel like I can hear the smallest noises come from outside. I can see perfectly in the dark. I look around the room and I feel like I stepped into an alternate universe. Everything looks the same, but something in the air is different. As if I was the only person in the world. I truly questioned if I was in the Twilight Zone. I am on edge, waiting for something to happen. 
I told myself. Okay, that's enough now. And I slowly come out of it. Then all my weight came back to my body. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I don't understand it. If this had happened at any other time in the day, I would have brushed it off. But then again, why do things like this happen at normal hours of the day? Weird Ghost or Spirit Encounter Just to preface, this happened like five years ago when I was a freshman in high school. I had been sick for a couple of days. This was in my parents' house, and to my knowledge, nobody's ever died there. I've never really been able to rationalize it, even though I generally don't believe in ghosts or anything like that. I was sleeping in bed and woke up. I think it was because my phone was playing music. It was about halfway through song Love by Kesia Cole, which is on my playlist at the time. I paused the song and checked the time. It was somewhere between 5 a.m., if I remember correctly. I turned over toward my door. Standing right next to my bed, there was a person or entity or something staring at me. It was dark, so I couldn't see it very well, but it looked like, oh, like a person wearing a dark robe and a white mask. No mouth. Small black eyes. The closest thing I can compare them to is No Face from Spirited Away. I remember not feeling afraid for some reason, and like I said, I was sick at the time, so I didn't really know what to do. So I just stared at it for about five minutes and went back to sleep. I woke up, I assumed it was a dream. That was until I opened up my phone and saw my music app, and it was open with Love by Keishia Cole on pause exactly where I'd stopped it that night. I talked to my dad about it, and he said it was probably a fever dream, but I don't understand how the music would be there. I don't listen to music to fall asleep, and as far as I can remember, the last app I used before bed was Snapchat. Nothing weird has happened since, but the experience weirds me out to this day. Any explanations would be appreciated, paranormal or otherwise. My family's experience at the Glen Tavern Inn. My mom sent me a text yesterday about Sharon Osborne being rushed to the hospital while filming a show at the Glen Tavern Inn. It reminded me of our experience there, and I wanted to post it. It wasn't really a crazy experience, but it's something that we can't explain. I think it was 2015. My mom, stepdad, brother, and I went to Santa Paula just for fun. We decided to stay at the Glen Tavern Inn because we thought it'd be cool to stay somewhere supposedly haunted. Right when we walked in, my mom said it felt like stepping into a different dimension. My stepdad started asking the man at the front desk if he ever had any, you know, paranormal experiences while working there. The man said yes and started talking about the things he would see. I think I remember him saying he would often see an older woman and a couple of kids in the hallways. He said he'd hear laughter, voices, loud footsteps, and music that wasn't actually playing. He also said the restaurant was quite active. Sadly, I don't remember the floor or room that we stayed in. Everything was pretty normal until my mom woke up around 5 a.m. When she did wake up, the bathroom faucet was turned on and the door to our room was open. I searched Glen Tavern Inn in this sub before writing this. In one of the posts, I found somebody also had an experience with the bathroom faucet turning on by itself. Thought that it was interesting. Paranormal I was contacted by a middle-aged couple regarding problems with the car overriding and operators driving commands. The car was recently given to their son by the parents of a deceased teen. The deceased person was actually their son's best friend, who was killed in a vehicle accident. That was when two had exchanged cars for the night. Their son had a new Jeep Cherokee that his friend wanted to use to go on a date. 
While on said date, the friend was involved in an accident with a drunk driver and perished. The deceased boy's parents signed over the title of his Toyota pickup both as a general gift, oh, excuse me, gift, and to replace his vehicle that was pretty much totaled in the wreck. I investigated the car with the help of the Toyota mechanic. He checked all systems including the computer, braking, engine, and all sensors. Nothing was found. I drove the truck for two days on my normal daily routine with my DVR, EMF meter, camcorder, and dash cam running. No evidence was collected. I returned the vehicle with my findings that I did not believe the vehicle was haunted. Six weeks later, I was again contacted by the couple. The father was using the truck when suddenly the vehicle made an abrupt right turn, locked up the brakes, and went into a ditch. At the same time, a car driven by a drunk entered the road from the side street without stopping and proceeded to slam into a tree. All of this was witnessed by a sheriff who just so happened to be near with the radar running. The drunk driver sustained minor injuries, excuse me, injuries, and the father was unhurt. It was provided with the sheriff's number and asked to call him. When I called and told him what I was calling in reference to, he was happy to share not only a reading of the, you know, report that he had filed, but information he said that could, well, not be included in the report. His report stated that while conducting normal duties, he witnessed a Mustang run a stop sign at the speed and turn into the road, fishtailing and tire squealing. Almost immediately, it left the road and slammed head-on to a tree, approximately 45 miles an hour. He checked the accident victim and found him unconscious with minor trauma to the forehead. There was an open bottle of vodka spilling on the passenger seat. The sheriff's statement not included in the report was, I parked facing an oncoming pickup truck when I witnessed it lock up. Its brakes, too, made a sharp right turn into the ditch. My initial thought was it was a stolen vehicle and the driver panicked when he saw me. Before I could react, the Mustang entered from the side road about 50 feet in front of me and turned toward the pickup truck which had entered the ditch about 200 feet before it would have reached the side of the road. The driver of the pickup could not have seen the Mustang's, Mustang's approach due to the trees and brush obscuring his line of sight. At least if he had not turned into that ditch, there would have been an unavoidable impact between these two vehicles. How he knew to react this way, that was beyond me. The driver's statement to me was that he wouldn't perform this action. At least, he thought that the truck did it by itself. Goats in the Kitchen I received a call from a couple who had recently purchased a new home and was having strange events occur in their barn. The backstory on this property is that the original home was built in the 1840s. The barn was added a few years later, but there was no record. The original house burned down in 1976, a new one built on the old foundation in 1981. Upon arriving, I noticed the property was impeccably kept, and though it was very rural and set back off the road, a driveway was added and paved to the house. This was unusual for the area, indicated to me a level of sophistication of the owners. In other words, they were most likely not from a rural area. So I was greeted at the door and invited in by a young couple that I would guess would be in their mid-twenties. The home was as well kept and clean on the inside as it had been way out, so we chatted for a few moments. They insisted that I see this barn. I noted that there was absolutely no feelings or atmosphere to the house, then followed them to the kitchen in the back door. There was a kitty fence blocking the entrance to the kitchen, preventing four miniature goats from exiting the kitchen. This was a shock, since I had judged these people by what I had witnessed up until this point, and when I asked about the goats in the house, I was told that they had no choice because whoever was in that barn tried to kill them. They had lost two goats already, and the vet told them that they were likely frightened to death. 
Approaching the barn, you could see that Malone well, had been at work putting their decorative style here also. So from the outside, there was a new fence surrounding the front and creating a small yard of about a quarter of an acre. It was clean and recently raked. The barn was in the style of an old tobacco barn that had been repurposed and painted. As we entered, I noticed the hair on my arms immediately standing. I definitely sensed something there. I asked if there was a specific area where there seemed to be more activity. I was shown the milking room that they had set up. The man told me that once he had built the milking stall, everything started. I asked for some time to poke around by myself. Notice that they practically ran out. I walked around the milking room for about an hour. That was a lot since it was a small room. On the opposite side of the barn, I found another room slightly larger than the milking room. It had a concrete floor and a freshly paneled and painted wall. It had electricity, a sink, and some equipment that I recognized as being used to make cheese. This room did not interest me at all. It felt sterile and uncomfortable like opening a room, or rather, like an operating room. I was sure nothing was lurking there. It wasn't until I was walking around in the stable area that I really felt something. This part of the barn had only a dirt floor, and although it was raked clean, it did not feel that way. I'm not a psychic, but I've learned to pay attention to my body and my impressions. To be honest with you, all that I wanted to do in that area was kind of rake it clean myself. Perplexed, I summoned the man, asked him if he had found anything in that area. He seemed slightly embarrassed as he explained that along the wall there had been a deep trench with something that looked like a pile of old leather that had been folded and stacked at one end of it. He asked me not to tell his wife, but he had just covered it over instead of removing it as he just felt like it was too dirty to touch. I asked for a shovel and assured him that I would not tell his wife, covered back up when I was finished. So we agreed, provided a shovel before hurrying back to the house. Five minutes later I'd located this leather. As the man had claimed, it was all dried and hard and did look as if it was nothing that anybody would ever want to touch. As I fought to unwrap it, I was struck with the feeling that it may cause me to get sick. I felt nauseated as I was handling it, and finally getting it unfolded, I found a very old memo-type book in it. The writing was still perfectly legible. I was a, or rather it, was a journal written by a Civil War soldier. As I scanned through it about halfway through, I found the last page of writing. It had blood on it and said, when you find me and read this, please tell Ma and Pa that I'm sorry. I tried to make it back home, but they caught me. I was shot, and I know I'll die quick. Please get my body home and bury me by the stream. I live in Savannah. Signed, Jonas. I refilled the hole and took the journal and leather to the front of the house. I asked the couple to come sit on the porch so we could talk. I showed them the journal and suggested that we hold a small memorial service in the barn. They invited the only neighbors they knew, and we just did that. We did it by the barn where I dug up the journal. I asked to take the journal with me, and the couple agreed, and I took the journal to the Savannah Historical Society and asked if they would keep it on display as a remembrance to a lost son. They agreed, and I gave it to them. Three weeks later, when I checked back with the couple, I was informed that the ghosts were back in the barn, and there were no issues. Goat Win A Cool Investigation I was called by a lady who swore that her cat was possessed. I was incredibly skeptical, but very curious. According to the lady, her cat would suddenly start screaming at the top of his lungs. It would do this crazy-looking, slow-motion walk while tilting its head at weird angles. If she tried to approach it when it did these things, it would lash out at her with its claws. After having one of these spells, it would hide, but not relax. Its tail would swing wildly, and it would growl to itself for upwards of an hour. 
As strange as all of this sounded, I spoke to one of my team members who's very sensitive. After hearing the story, she insisted that we investigate. We arrived at the residence at around 4.30 p.m. The lady gave us a tour of the house and introduced us to the cat. It was a standard 3 by 2 ranch-style home, and we found nothing creepy about it. The cat was cool, very affectionate, and really took to my fellow investigator. She spent a couple of hours alone with the cat while I got to the paperwork and formalities done with the lady. She invited us to investigate the home that night, as she had a date, then worked on the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift at the local hospital. She left for her date around 7.30 p.m., and we began our formal investigation. We moved room to room asking questions and hoped that the EVP or maybe at least a knock in response to a question would happen. Yet, we had no activity until at least 11.30 p.m. The cat started screaming in the master bedroom. Upon entering the doorway, my partner grabbed my shoulder, stopping me and motioning finger to lip for me to be quiet and to listen. It was hard with the cat screaming. They made my hair stand on end, and as we watched and listened, a shadow began to form in the corner of the room. There was a whisper coming from the shadow that was not recorded by our DVRs. We couldn't understand what it was being said, and the cat was irate. It was scared and ready to fight. So we witnessed the claims of the lady firsthand, and they were exactly as she described. My partner spoke very calmly to the shadow. You're scaring the cat. I don't think you mean to, so if you leave this room and go into the bedroom across the hall, we'll help you. We turned and entered the smaller bedroom, sat quietly on the bed waiting to see what would happen. A few moments later, my partner grabbed my arm and pointed at the doorway into the spare bathroom. This is shared by the two smaller bedrooms. I could clearly see a humanoid shape with no features but it was blacker than the dark. This teammate and I had worked together many times, had a routine that we followed. I told the entity that everything was okay. The cat's calm now, and we all want to know that we can help. It slowly moved through the doorway and sort of slightly into the room. At that point, I heard through the DVR the word kitty. While recording, I always plug in an earpiece so I can hear what's being recorded in real time. I asked if it was trying to pet the kitty and it stretched out its arm pointing toward the master bedroom where the cat was. I asked if it wanted to hurt the kitty and almost immediately heard a sigh and a whimper. I asked again if it wanted to hurt the kitty and stated that in order for us to help, it needed to answer. My partner told me a minute later that it answered. She sensed that it indicated that it only wanted to pet the cat. She also sensed that this was the spirit of an adolescent male. She thought that in life he had some type of developmental issue. While we spoke to the entity, it seemed to sway slightly back and forth. But it didn't go anywhere. It seemed that it was listening to a conversation. I once again spoke to it, saying that it had scared the cat, and if it wanted to pet it, it would have to make friends with it. I explained that if it did, it would just sit still and speak to the cat, and that it would learn that, well, you don't want to hurt it. Eventually, the cat will come to you and let you pet it. A moment later, the cat appeared in the hallway doorway and just sat down calmly. No one spoke or even moved, including the spirit. A few moments later, the cat joined us on the bed. I spoke to it calmly, and my partner scratched his neck and head. As I looked back up from the cat at the spirit, I noticed that it was gone. We, or our experience, well, rather, excuse me, we experienced nothing else. Then we locked up the house and left. Two days later, my teammate called me very excited. She had researched the property and found that a young man who had Down syndrome had died on the property when he had fallen out of a treehouse. We gathered our evidence and met the lady the following day. 
I played her all of the recordings of us talking to the spirits, that way, you know, she would understand what exactly had happened. When she heard me tell the spirit how to make friends with the cat, she began to cry. She told us that only that morning the cat was on the bed in the smaller bedroom. It was purring very loud and moving its head like somebody was scratching it. A Weird Ghost Hunt I spent many years stationed in Germany. I did two-year tours, mostly, and each was in a different place. This occurred while stationed in Kitzingen, Larsen Barracks. That base was flanked by forest. There was an old abbey located a couple of miles away through the forest, and it was said to be haunted. A couple of other guys in my company were interested in ghosts also. We had investigated a few of the castles around the general area, so when we heard about this place, it was a no-brainer. Our plan was to set out Friday after last formation, make the hike to set up camp. We slept that night and the next morning we went to the abbey. It had been closed for years, but it was open during the day for tours. After it closed for the day, no one was supposed to be on the grounds, but that was not enforced nor patrolled. It was basically left open. Upon arriving, we took the tour and learned the history and layout. Indeed. Around noon, we went back to the camp to fix some lunch and relax before ghost hunting at around 10 p.m. When we reached the camp, it was destroyed. It appeared that some kind of animal had gotten into everything. I threw all of our personal stuff from our backpacks all over, tore down our shelter, and, well, basically just made a big mess without destroying anything. We cleaned up and reset camp. None of our food was missing. But that wasn't surprising since most of it was in cans. Surprisingly, there were a couple of boxes of crackers and a loaf of bread that hadn't been taken or damaged. Around 10 p.m. that night, we went back to the abbey. We investigated it thoroughly inside and out. We never heard or saw a thing. We stuck it out until about 4 a.m. hoping something might show up. But nothing really did. We made our way back to camp disappointed and tired. When we got there, that animal had been back. It had done the exact same thing as before, except this time those boxes of crackers and loaves of bread were scattered around like everything else, out of the wrappers and on the ground. We were pretty pissed off. If we had been able to see the hike out, we would have, but those woods were too dark. Once again, we cleaned up, and about an hour before it would start getting light out, we crashed for a few hours. Two hours later, I was startled awake by one of the guys yelling and cussing up a storm. The camp was trashed again, and we had slept through it. Even our shelter halves had been ripped down as we slept underneath them. The only difference was that our personal items, socks, underwear, and t-shirts were made into a trail leading out of camp. We packed up everything and started following the trail of clothing. When we reached the last of it, there was a small pile consisting of one pair of underwear, belonging to each of us, and the crotch had been ripped out of each one. About a hundred feet away, we could see the perimeter fence to our base. We never went back into that forest the rest of the time I was stationed there. I would take that as a threat, person, animal, or ghost. No thanks. True Ghost Story When I was in high school, my friends and I used to go to Black Snake Road to race each other. It was in a very rural area, and it had little traffic and was very dark. We called it that because of several hairpin turns. However, there was a perfect half mile that was marked by a bridge on one end and a train track on the other. One night after several of us had been racing, I found that I was the last to leave. As I approached the bridge, I saw a girl standing there dripping wet. I stopped and asked if she was okay, and she responded that her boyfriend missed the bridge and crashed into the water. She said that he was still in the truck. 
got out of my car and ran around the side of the bridge down the embankment. There was no deep river, but just a shallow creek. I saw no evidence of a truck or anything out of the ordinary. Returning to the top of the bridge, I found her standing next to my car, dripping wet and crying. There's no cell phones back then, so I offered to drive her home so that way we could call the police from there. She accepted and directed me to her home. On the ride, she told me that her name was Sally. Her home was directly across the street from a small church. It's like a couple's away from the bridge. As we pulled into the driveway, she asked me to go to the door and get her mother. I knocked at the door of the dark house, feeling a little bit uneasy. After all, it was after midnight by that point, and I knew that I was waking everybody in the house. After a few moments, an older lady answered the door, who I assumed was her grandmother. I told her what had happened, and that Sally was upset and wanted her mother to come to the car. That's when the story got even stranger. The lady told me that her daughter Sally had been dead for over 30 years. She had drowned when her boyfriend missed the bridge and flipped his truck, trapping her inside. Surprised and not thinking very clearly, I insisted that she come to my car, which she did. Slippers, house coat, and all. The passenger side window was rolled down, which Sally had done. My old Malibu had crank windows. They were a pain to roll down, and I couldn't reach the handle from the driver's seat. There was a puddle in the passenger seat, but no Sally. The lady asked me to walk across the road to the graveyard next to the church. We did, and she showed me Sally's grave. That instant started a 40-year pursuit of the paranormal for me. I've investigated all over the world since then while serving the military in my work afterwards. Ghosts are real. That would have convinced me as well. A humming low-frequency growl during sleep paralysis. Someone asked me to tell this story from my other post about my house's corner-peeping ghost. I suffer from occasional sleep paralysis. When this happens, I wake up from what is usually a nightmare. Sometimes there is no nightmare, though. But I can't open my eyes or move except to scream a muffled groan. I also feel an immense weight or pressure on my chest, like some people describe as something holding them down. This goes on for a few minutes until I can either snap out of it or my girlfriend rushes over to me to soothe or gently wake me up. This has happened a number of times over the years, but a couple of instances in particular stand out. So I was having an episode of sleep paralysis, but this night it happened twice, back to back. So I'd just fallen asleep not 30 minutes when suddenly my head started to buzz and vibrate. It also got very cold in this instance. Like other episodes, I couldn't move, but this time I could open my eyes. However, I couldn't see. It was like what some visually impaired people describe as only being able to see out of their peripheral vision. It was not just a blackness in the main view of my vision, and it was paired with this visual, like, headache-inducing vibration in my skull. It had the sound of a booming, low-frequency hum. Not a whole unlike when you hear the deep bass hits and music of the movie Inception but just one note very low and a loud note. It was terrifying because it never happened like this before. Finally, I managed to wake up, get some water, tell my girlfriend about it, and attempt to sleep again. But it happened again. Same blindness, same humming, same symptoms. My girlfriend then had to shake me out of it this time. Needless to say, I wasn't able to go back to sleep until the following night out of exhaustion. The other incident was a night terror where I was haunted by a demon or a witch. I felt sharp, long nails piercing into my chest, but I couldn't wake up. I felt the pain of being impaled.
What is this and how to get rid of it? So a long time ago, about three summers ago maybe, me and my three cousins were playing hide and seek. We had played with the Ouija board the day prior. Anyways, we all heard footsteps outside my bedroom door while we were hiding. When I came out to look, there was no one there. Anyways, that's old news. It's been a while and I've had several more experiences and I fear it's getting stronger, whatever it is. So after a while, I started to have several nights where I would experience sleep paralysis. I would wake up and I would see a little girl out of the corner of my eye. She was young and had gray skin, patchy hair, and looked like she had been crying. There had been black lines going down from the corners of her eyes. Anyways, it was like she was shy and really didn't like being looked at. Eventually moved out of my parents' house, moved in with a now former girlfriend. Didn't seem like her at all. There was one morning she woke up in the middle of the night screaming and asked me to look at her back. She had three red lines going down her back. There was another time where her girlfriend was playing on my Xbox, and all of a sudden her hair was grabbed and yanked back. Meanwhile, while I'm living away from home, my family are experiencing something mimicking their voice. My mom heard my sister call her from upstairs, and my sister heard my mom call her downstairs. And, by the way, neither did neither. And last night, I heard it calling my name. First it used my sister's voice, then switched to my mom's voice. Then strangely used my former girlfriend's voice. I'm afraid it's slowly getting stronger. I don't want to do one thing that only makes it mad or more strong. What would that one thing be? I wonder. Hide and seek with more than my three cousins. So a bit of backstory. Last summer, my cousins came to spend it with my family, so there was four kids and two adults in the house. Me and my oldest cousin were in my room playing with the plastic Ouija board around eight-ish. Obviously, nothing happened. I throw slurs into the empty dark room while my cousin laughed and we walked away from the board. I don't think I would have had to say goodbye since nothing really happened. Well, I might have been wrong. Later that night, around ten-ish, the two youngest asked us to play hide-and-seek with them. I thought, why not, and agreed. We played a couple of rounds, and nothing happened. Skip to round twelve. I men were... I remember this vividly. I was in my closet, hiding my youngest cousin beside me. She didn't really know where else to hide. My oldest cousin hiding underneath my covers on my bed and my pillows on top of her. My oldest cousin was getting kind of tired of not being found first, decided to hide there so it'd be easy to jump out and scare my sister who was seeking. Now I think it would be wise to mention that we are upstairs, parents were downstairs. The stairs up, even though carpeted, they still creak. We heard the garage door open and that's where my sister was counting. She does the old... Ready or not, here I come. And it's a bit of a walk from the garage door to the stairs, so we're all just waiting. There is no creak at the stairs, but all of a sudden we hear, like, footsteps pacing up back and forth in front of the doorway. My cousin, thinking it was her, jumps out from the covers and does a fake scream. Following, a blood-curdling scream. I burst out from the closet and look toward the open doorway. As I do, I catch a glimpse of a dark, distorted figure that flies to the left. Being the oldest, I ran out of the door. To the left is a bathroom. I searched everywhere, but it was gone. My oldest cousin mentioned later that we had forgot to say goodbye. I simply responded, I know. Possible encounter in the woods. Whistles and foul odor. I am male 20, 
and me and my buddies enjoyed late night walks on the trails within the various conservation areas in my region of southwestern Ontario. Late last week we decided to check out an area called Pleasant Valley. To my knowledge, this area has a deep-rooted history with the Underground Railroad, indigenous peoples, as well as the War of 1812, if I'm not mistaken, given its, pers given its proximity to Lake Erie. We entered the woods at around 2 a.m., and immediately upon entering, I was overcome with a bad feeling. And after walking for some time, the feeling progressively worsened until we reached two bent trees and an X over the path. My one buddy pointed out the fact that it's bad juju to go underneath. We should just call it a night as we all felt watched. As soon as we turned around and started to head back, the entire forest seemed dramatically quieter. We all hear a loud, distinctively human whistle behind us. Almost like what you would do to call a dog over. There's no way anybody could have been out there at that hour, and there's no homes in close enough proximity for somebody to be out and about. We all ran, and I honestly was terrified. My friends were all relatively big guys, and were all comfortable in the woods, so it took a lot to get us running. Upon leaving, there was a faint smell of rotting eggs, and it was not present upon our initial entry. Played hide-and-seek alone, and now weird things are happening in my home. It begins with me and two of my girlfriends playing the so-called game hide-and-seek alone. I've played it twice before, but nothing ever happened. We do the usual prepare the doll, put one of our hairs inside, and start the game. Never heard of that one. We go to hide, all of us sitting on a windowsill behind a thick curtain, our legs propped on the radiator underneath. I started with a strong mindset, as I don't believe in the paranormal. Not even a minute into the game, I started hearing soft pads of what seemed to be little feet stuffed with rice slowly going from the bathroom to my room. One of my other friends looked at me in shock. I later found out she was hearing a lot of other unexplainable noise such as furniture doing the bumpy sound. Knowing I do not want to fuck around, we ran to the bathroom to split, excuse me, spit salt water on the doll. When I ran past my room, I could still hear the little pit pants of the tiny feet. When we go to the bathroom, the doll had moved. Nothing had in fact moved. We had the ritual and choose to throw the plushie away carefully handpicked all the hairs we left in there and burnt them. Now the weird shit begins. It spreads in the course of about three or four months. Bullet Point Uno It was 6 a.m. the same day, at least the same day we did the ritual. I was smoking a cigarette with one of the girlfriends. While we were chatting, a cigarette butt sprung up from the ashtray and rolled into the table. We both saw it. Bullet point number two. A few days later, I was home alone with my boyfriend. I went to feed the cats in my mom's room, and I saw my old crusty, dusty lamp was turned on. Bullet point number three. A week after the lamp, I had an incident with the guy who would come to my door at weird hours of the night and ring the intercom, looking for me with a knife. My intercom started ringing at 4 a.m., and I decided that that was it, and I f just filed a police report. While waiting for that, I talked with the administrator of the block of flats, asked her to look on the security cameras and tell me what he was doing the previous night. The administrator said nobody ringed my intercom at 4 a.m. that night. She looked from 3 a.m. through to 4.30 a.m. with no person coming or going out of my block. Bullet point four. Some time passes, and a month later, the same two girlfriends come to sleep over. This one, by far, is the weirdest. I usually sleep on the couch in my living room. I went to sleep at around 3 a.m. I'll call them A and B for easier description. I'll call them Anne and Beth. Anne has a weird feeling all night. 
waking up continuously to look at the hallway to check if somebody's there. At around 3.30, Beth feels three fingers tapping her shoulder twice and waking her up. Beth told me she felt the couch was very crowded. She turns around, sees me, just my hair, the rest submerged in blankets, sleeping between her and Anne. She goes back to sleep. Some time later, a light from a weird electrical box, which we don't even use behind the TV, turns on and wakes Beth up. She's a light sleeper, and it was pitch black in the living room. She gets up to grab a shirt and throws it in front of the light. She drinks some water and stuff, and then she turns on the flashlight and sees my hair. Again, this time, hugging Anne from behind. Beth says, Good night. Good night, Anne. Anne responds to her. I don't. In the morning, I was no longer with them in bed. They come to wake me up and ask me if I'd slept with them. Of course, I was very shocked. I told them I'd been in the room since I was asleep. I've never sleepwalked my life, and I'm a heavy corpse sleeper. Wherever you put me, I don't move an inch until I've slept enough. I sigh, grab my sage, not expecting anything. Close all the windows and doors in my home, sit on the couch and light the sage. Where I was sitting, the air became very cold. My whole right side turned cold as ice. Bullet point number five. The day before today, the big water bowl I keep for my pets in the bathroom, with roughly one liter of water inside of it, was spilled. My mother found it. The bowl was completely empty. There was no water to be found. The bathroom tiles were dry, no lick of water anywhere. I cannot explain where it went. Bullet point number six. Forward to today, I wake up at around 11 a.m., walk my dog, have a shower, eat something. Anne was over at my place, sleeping on the couch. I go back to sleep while waiting for Anne to wake up, and for context, I have had over 15 sleep paralysis phenomena happen to me. So I'm never scared of it, I just, well, I'm highly uncomfortable because I can't breathe and my body hurts and can't move. I start dreaming. I see my room, I get up to go to the living room. Anne was no longer there. In her place right where she was sleeping, I saw a figure who looked a lot like her, just very disfigured, wearing a robe that Anne was wearing in my house. The person or thing was staring right into my soul. I get scared and lock myself in the room and I lay in bed. I start experiencing sleep paralysis, but this time I'm terrified. For some reason, in reality now, Anne already woke up. I see her open my door to wake me up. I was experiencing sleep paralysis and trying to give her signals to wake me up. She decides to let me sleep, not knowing I'm in terrible pain and scared as fuck. She leaves. I can't wake myself from the paralysis this time. I fall asleep eventually. I start dreaming again, I think. It's just 40 minutes on the clock of me trying to really, well, just stand up from the bed. But some force kept pushing me back down and pinning me with strength, suffocating me, and I was paralyzed. My whole body hurt and I was so fucking scared. I felt a presence near me on the right. I kept trying to grab the phone, but I would just keep dropping it. I was barely barely able to even move. I felt so awake the whole time, and when 40 minutes passed in real life, I hear the kitchen door open and Anne coming to wake me up. Exactly the second she opens the door, this unexplainable force just disappears. I spring up on my butt on the bed, shouting Anne's name, instantly starting to cry. I knew it was 40 minutes because <clears throat> Anne had texted me when she woke up. When she actually woke me up from the horrible shit, I checked my phone. For some reason, I really thought I was going to die. I'd never been this terrified. Guys, am I crazy? What's going on? I know this all sounds impossible or made up, but believe me. It turned from a joke to something that's starting to really scare me. Broke this post because I can't sleep. What should I do? My childhood dog's ghost is playing with our Christmas tree lights. For some background, when my dog passed, we took him to a guy who did pet cremation. 
prepared a cute memorial gift like paw prints and such. My mom asked what got him interested in the business. He told us the story about his first dog. To make a long story short, when she died, he had placed a garden light around the place where she was buried. We used to hang out a lot there. I don't quite remember, but let's assume it was the latter, since, if I'm not mistaken, the first is illegal. This light kept turning on even when it wasn't supposed to, and even after it broke, he said it kept lighting up anyway. The guy was a little kooky. I think you have to be a little bit kooky working in that type of business. So I just smiled and nodded, appreciating the story as more of the story he used to console himself after the death of his beloved pet. This past week, however, I've been at my mom's house for Christmas. And this decorative Christmas tree that's placed on the mantel next to where our dogs are and our boxes kept keeps turning on and off randomly. At first, I assumed my mom was turning it off and on, and she came and went. But then one day, she asks who keeps turning it off and on. One by one, everybody said it wasn't them. And honestly, I believe it. I know my family, and I know when one of them is messing with us. We're not very good at keeping pranks going for very long, because we can't keep a straight face. This morning, it was off again. So my mom goes to see if the battery ran out or if somebody turned it off. She flips the switch once and it stays off. So she flips it again and suddenly it's back on. So clearly it was not the battery. Nobody had turned it off. It seemed to turn on by itself anytime there's people in the area and turn off when we leave. As if he came to hang out with us and when we were there, he, like we used to when he was alive. To make things more interesting, anytime it's on, our dogs seem to like hanging out and sleeping in that area which they usually don't. And a funny slash ironic anecdote. My current dog's name's Ghost. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being sentimental like I thought the guy was being, so... You know, you can believe the story or see it as a consolation story. I don't be offended either way, because honestly, I'm not sure what to think of it myself. The logical part of my brain wants to say it's just faulty wiring, but my heart wants to believe that it's my childhood dog. I want to know what the illegal thing is that you're talking about. Illegal to put a light on at night? If you're hearing me, clear that up for me. My curiosity is killing me. My grandpa was in the audience. When I was younger, I used to perform in community theater plays and musicals a whole lot. I went on to get a degree in acting, and I'm now working as a professional stage actor, but I got my start in little community theaters in my hometown. One of the last shows that I was in before moving away for college was Monty Python's Spamalot. It's essentially the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail, but turned into a stage musical. I loved being in this show. It was hilarious, and the audience loved us every night. You have good taste, sir. Or ma'am. On the closing night of the show, we were performing one of the big dance numbers in the second act. This number involved several members of the cast, myself included, running down from the stage and into the aisles of the audience to do a little bit of fun audience interaction. When I got to my mark in the aisle, I locked eyes with a man just a few rows away from where I was, maybe two or three seats from the aisle. The auditorium was dark, and I never would have expected this in my wildest dreams, so it took me a few moments to really even have it register. This man was my grandfather who had passed away four years prior to this. No, it wasn't somebody who looked like him, unless he had a secret identical twin. This was my grandfather. And there's no two ways around it. He made eye contact back at me, gave me a thumbs up, and stumbled back to the stage as I forgot my choreography due to all what I saw. I made a mental note of where he was sitting and looked back to the seat during the next scene of the show. Sure enough, by then he was no longer there. The seat was empty. Checked multiple times throughout the rest of the show, wondering if the seat was just empty due to somebody getting up to use the restroom, but no. It remained empty. I even went so far as to ask the box office manager after the performance, who confirmed that nobody had purchased that seed for that performance. He's got good taste, too.
Now, when I posted an image on here, I'd never personally seen anything spooky in my house. But that changed this morning around 6.45 a.m. I know because I messaged my boyfriend immediately and the time is dated to 6.45. Recently moved back into my dad's house, which is the house seen in a recent picture I shared on here. And sometimes I'm alone, or when my dad and I are both upstairs, I hear cupboard doors opening, somebody using her downstairs tap, etc. But I never really let it get to me, as while I do believe in supernatural things, I don't go too far into it. But then this morning when I woke up, I was scared shitless by what I saw. I was laid facing the bedroom wall for a moment, my back to the rest of the room. I wondered what the time was and rolled back over to check. It was when I looked up above my side table when I saw this young boy. It was giving me the Kubrick stare, the one where you tilt your head down and look through your eyebrows. He was grinning, his eyes looked pink, and he was just standing there. I immediately jumped up and he was still there, turned on the light, it was gone. He felt like I had a panic attack or something, so I messaged my boyfriend immediately. I didn't know what I saw, it really freaked me out. Still watching over us. I, a 40-year-old male, unintentionally piggybacked on someone's post and instead of taking away from them, I figured I would make my own. Growing up in Hispanic household, you hear a lot about the paranormal, and mostly everybody's experienced something. I am no different. My parents bought their own home when I was around three. Never since then I always felt or witnessed odd things. But there are too many little incidents to bore you with, but they all have one thing in common, and that is that they all happen close by or in the hallway to that home. This event doesn't happen there, and instead happens in my own home just last year. My mom passed away in 2020. Since 2001, she had dialysis three times a week at 5 a.m. I was in my 20s, not married, lived with both my parents at the time, and I would take her every time to her appointments. Whenever I did a late shift at work or would sleep over, she would just walk to my door and say, I'm ready, we can go. I would get up and drive her. I'm now married with kids of my own and in my own house, and last year my wife had a schedule for an outpatient surgery in the early morning. I was working in another state but drove home the day before. Got home in the early hours of the morning and told my wife I was going to sleep in the couch for three hours till we had to leave. Her wake-up alarm was about to ring, so with her eyes closed, she said, Okay. I was in deep sleep. The three hours flew by like a wink, but then I clearly heard my mom say, I'm ready. We can go. I woke up and immediately realized what I'd heard. I hear my wife open the restroom door, and she walks over to me and says, Oh, good. I was about to wake you. Till this day, I know what I heard, and I know that she's still around, watching over me. It wasn't so much as a scary incident, but definitely unexplained. See ya.